Rio Lobo was a 1970 American Western film that starred the amazing John Wayne. Howard Hawks directed it. This is actually the last film that he directed. The script was done by Lee Brackett, and the film was actually shot in Technicolor, and it had a running time of about 114 minutes. Along with John Wayne, there's also some other great actors involved in this movie. Jorge Rivero, Jennifer O'Neill, Jack Elam, Victor French, and Sherry Lansing. Now, I've got kind of an inside track on this movie, and we'll get into this a little bit later on. I was able to sit down with Jennifer O'Neill and talk about this movie in her Nashville home. So some of the stuff you're going to hear later on in this video is going to be straight from the horse's mouth. There are some really interesting insights that Jennifer O'Neill gave me into the production of Rio Lobo. So stick around for that, because I'm sure you're going to love that part of it. Now, this was the third of Howard Hawks' films that kind of varied the idea of a sheriff defending his office against a bunch of belligerent outlaw elements in the town. The first being Rio Bravo. He did that in 1959. He also did El Dorado in 1966. And both of those also starred John Wayne. The film was actually meant to be shot in Durango, Mexico, and the budget was initially $5 million. They ended up running into a scheduling conflict with Lawman that took up the facilities there, so Howard Hawks changed the location to Old Tucson Studios, and I think some other shooting was actually done near Los Angeles. These changes added to the budget about a $1 million. Now, it's said that Howard Hawks was injured during the filming of the railway scene, that he actually ended up getting four stitches. I'm not sure what happened to him, but I've read that in a couple of places. Now, this film might be a little bit saddle-weary, considering that it's just a variation on the two other films that Howard Hawks did. But you have to realize, this is John Wayne's last film with Howard Hawks, and it has a wonderful sense to it. The humor in it actually lights up a fairly listless and worn-out story. Jorge Rivero and Robert Mitchum's son, Chris Mitchum, play the Confederate looters snatching Union gold. And John Wayne is the colonel trying to find out the traitor who is feeding information to the robbers. Meanwhile, the wild-eyed Jack Elam adds a certain flair to this movie. I think he should have been in this movie much more than he was. Now, it's said that Robert Mitchum visited his son, Christopher Mitchum, during the filming of this movie. And that's one thing that Jennifer O'Neill told me, is that she met so many interesting people on the set of this movie. Not just John Wayne or the director, Howard Hawks. She met a ton of influential people that were there because of the director and the main star, John Wayne. But anyway, it's said that Howard Hawks asked the elder Mitchum, to reprise his El Dorado role as a drunken sheriff. But Mitchum claimed that he's now really retired. And John Wayne looked at him and responded, Mitch, you've been saying you were retiring ever since the first day I met you. John Wayne was in really poor health during the filming of the movie, and he frequently had difficulty getting on and off his horse. He was still recovering from tearing a ligament in his shoulder while filming the undefeated, but also at the same time, he had had his lung removed, and so he didn't have a whole lot of stamina. That's one thing that Jennifer O'Neill told me, that during the scene where he has to carry her up the stairs, he became just completely exhausted. He really struggled through it. It's also said that John Wayne felt that Jack Elam had stole a few scenes from him in this movie, and therefore he vetoed him in the casting in The Great Train Robbers in 1973. I think he did outdo John Wayne in this film. Jack Elam is a spark in this movie. Now, during a break during the filming, John Wayne went and collected his Oscar for the movie True Grit from 1969. He was given that from Barbara Streisand at the 42nd Annual Academy Awards. When he returned, every member of the cast on the movie Rio Lobo was wearing an eye patch, including his horse. 
Howard Hawks had originally planned on reteaming John Wayne with Robert Mitchum, his co-star, in the popular previous movie, El Dorado. He later found out that the production company would not fund two expensive stars like this. So he decided to hire Jorge Rivero, who was a major star in Mexico, but he was virtually unknown in the U.S., and he spoke very little English. And Howard Hawks felt that he couldn't hold his own in the scenes with John Wayne. Now, this is a common scenario you're going to see in this video of mine, is that Howard Hawks blames almost everybody but himself for the failure of this movie. And when I say failure, I don't mean that in the terms of it not being a good movie. It just critically was not accepted, and it didn't make the dollars that his past films had made. He just basically wore out this theme. Howard Hawks, when he finished the movie, said that he didn't think it was any good. He blamed the film's poor critical and commercial performance on John Wayne, saying that he was too old. How can you blame John Wayne for a movie not being good? That's impossible. He also ended up blaming Jennifer O'Neill, saying that she was inexperienced and that she was hard to work with. Now, Jennifer O'Neill actually admitted to me that she really didn't want to be in this movie. She wanted to work with New York actors. She had been studying acting in New York, and she was anticipating working with stars like Dustin Hoffman and the likes. She wasn't that excited about working with John Wayne. Now, she did tell me that John Wayne was the nicest guy in the world, that he went out of his way to help young actors and actresses try to improve their performance. He really went over and above what he needed to, being the star that he was. Now, one of the other actors in the film is Sherry Lansing, and she went on to become a mammoth force in Hollywood. She became the first woman to head a major Hollywood studio when she became president of 20th Century Fox in 1980. In 1992, she became the chairman of Paramount Pictures, and she stepped down as the CEO in 2004. Now, when Jennifer O'Neill originally talked to Howard Hawks about this movie, he walked directly up to her and punched her in the gut, and he told her that her voice was way too high. And he told her to go out in the woods and just sit there and scream at trees. In other words, he wanted her voice to roughen up. When I was spending time with Jennifer in Nashville, she actually told me that it hurt when he punched her. I mean, he did it with some intent. He also told her that he would make her a star if she would just sign a three-picture deal. She didn't want to do that. After that, his feelings toward her changed. He treated her bad on the set, and he actually told her that he would ruin her career. Now, I think a little bit in defense of Howard Hawks. At this point in his life, I don't think all his mental functions were clicking on all cylinders. I've heard this from numerous sources, and Jennifer O'Neill confirmed this when I talked with her. She said that on one occasion, they were shooting a scene, and just as a joke, she stuck a fake mustache on herself, and they went ahead and filmed the scene. Howard Hawks yelled cut and print, and didn't even notice that she had this fake mustache on the whole time they were shooting. Now, this is not beat up Howard Hawks Day, although I think he deserves some of it for this film because I really don't like the way he is blaming everybody else when it actually was a problem that was innate in the production. He had just actually worn out a really popular idea. Now, there's no way I can close this video out without talking to you about Jennifer O'Neill. What a lovely lady this is, and what a great thing that she is doing in Nashville with her hope and healing at Hill and Glade. This is a transition program that's equine assisted for our first responders and our military personnel that are struggling to get through life. I just can't tell you how much I believe in what she is doing. And every time I do a video that has Jennifer O'Neill in it, you can bet money that there will be a link in the description for her farm in Nashville. In the spring, we plan to actually do a live stream on YouTube 
that will have Jennifer O'Neill and myself to where you can actually ask us a variety of things. Whether you would like to talk to myself about my YouTube channel or whether you would like to talk to Jennifer O'Neill about her career and her fantastic life. So make sure you check the links in the description of my video here, and there'll be links to her farm in Nashville. You guys know that my channel never asks for a dime, but I do believe in helping this cause. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.